let's open the um, new meeting of the Montpelier Roxbury um, School Board of Directors um, for our first meeting of the new session. Um, and tonight we are going to uh, reorganize and we also um, Congratulations to Mia, Emma, and Amanda, who got elected to, uh, Mia and Amanda got elected to the two three-year terms that were up, and Emma got elected to the remainder of a three-year term that expires um, in 2022. Um, so we all have a full board, and then... Um, both a congratulations and a thank you to Kristen Gettler, who just, I believe you got elected via write-in yesterday, who got elected via write-in uh, from Roxbury, um, who is taking uh, the three-year term that uh, Ryan Zajac um, just served out. So uh, congrats to everyone and thank you. Um, just a couple of notes on uh, the agenda, one thing I, I definitely want to do is um, we need to set a date for a retreat. So we're going to discuss that quickly as well. I think the best time is likely in May. Um, also, in preparation for that, uh, and also just to get people thinking, we had a you know difficult year with, with COVID where that was a huge focus. Um, and we also managed to do some great work on the, the SRO. But um, what I'd love to do, assuming I'm re-elected chair, is just reach out to everyone, uh, talk to people about their top three priorities. I think they really want the board to focus on this year um, and then kind of use that to put together an agenda for a retreat where we can can map out some priorities and, and how to get things done. I know we've got you know a lot of big issues from continuing the safety work to picking up some of the, the buildings work that, that Andrew was working on before COVID. Um, as well as Jill uh, in the MSMS committee. You know, we're going to hear about um, carbon emissions tonight, which is another big priority. Um, you know, we've we've talked about um, you know, Roxbury, and obviously our diversity, equity, and inclusion work is is um, a huge thing we need to to focus on, continuing to carry forward. So a lot of a lot of things to kind of refocus on as we enter the new year, um, and a retreat is a good place to do that. Um, I also want to propose, um, we, ha we have both the superintendent evaluation and um, a negotiations update for the executive session. I want to propose, and let me know if anyone has a um, reservation about doing this, doing a, just a one-hour executive session on the superintendent evaluation. Um, with kind of both, you know, Kristen not having, I think, any real context on that at all or any ability to look over the documents uh, and this being a new process to a lot of, of board members rather than trying to have a hurried discussion late at night. It might just be good to do a special meeting for an hour and just kind of sit through and talk through and make sure we kind of, um, you know, get both, um, you know, questions answered about the process and, um, you know, get uh, a document that we all all like. Um, uh, and just all, all the all the feedback has been very positive so far, but it's a it's a complicated process and a, a big part of of the um, board's work. So um, unless folks feel otherwise, I think it might just be both easier and less wearisome to to just set aside an hour when we're we're fresh and, and we can just delve into it. Um, hey Jim, yeah. do we need to take roll? We do. I'm going to do that in just a second. Okay. Great. I was just going to lay out the agenda stuff. Um, and I think that's all it on the agenda. So um, I'll just run through Jerry. Here. Um, Jill. Here. Kristen. Here. Um, Andrew. Here. Uh, Etiquette. Here. Emma. Here. Amanda. Aki here. And Mia. Here. Great. Um, 
So first order of business is public comment. Um, if you uh, want to comment, either use your raise hand function, which is in the participant bar, uh, or you can just either wave with your hand, or if that's not getting my attention, just unmute yourself and, and, and shout a hey. Looks like we have Ann Watson. Anyone else? Um, Ann, go ahead and uh, although everyone knows you, please introduce yourself for work on the camera. Great. Hello. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Ann Watson. I am a resident of Montpelier. I'm a teacher at the school at Montpelier High School. I teach physics, engineering, and math. And I also happen to be the mayor of Montpelier. And I am here sort of wearing both a little bit of each of those hats uh, to, a, to a small degree here. Um, I sent most of you an email uh, just within the last couple of days about uh, carbon, about uh, carbon pollution and our, uh, this, the district's responsibility to uh, address that. Except I don't think I sent it to, um, to Jerry or Kristen. So I will forward that on to the both of you. Um, so I, I don't have a lot to add to that. It was somewhat of a dissertation, so uh, my apologies for the, the length of it. Um, but uh, I'm going to assume that those to those of you whom I sent it that uh, you got a chance to read it. So I just have a couple things I want to um, highlight from that. Um, uh, the first, uh, or, and, and elaborate a little bit, um, which is that, uh, you know, in terms of the district's uh, history of carbon um, emissions in terms of uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, I do actually think that there has been some progress that has been made by the district, uh, but I think it would be useful to see what what the track record is. Um, what is the history over time of the the district's um, uh, you know, pollution record, uh, it, you know, greenhouse gas emission record um, over time to see if it's trending in the right directions, to see what can uh, be addressed, what needs to be addressed um, moving forward. Uh, and I, I just want to emphasize that uh, those, that kind of data should be a part of the regular review of uh, this board. Uh, it seems natural that we take data about things that we care about. But I think the inverse is also uh, sort of true in that once you start collecting data, that actually encourages people to care more about it. Uh, and so even just the act of collecting that data and, and having it in front of people uh, actually incites people to, to be invested in that and to, to care more about it. Uh, so that's, that's an important part. I also want to make sure that you are uh, well aware that you do not have to uh, tackle reducing uh, carbon pollution on your own. Uh, the city has made a net zero uh, commitment. We're aiming to be net zero by 2030 uh, for just the municipal operations. And uh, we're, we're actually, uh, we're about to be in, uh, announcing uh, who the city will be partnering with in terms of making a plan uh, to reach 2030 and uh, our hope and, and my understanding as well is that uh, the school will be participating in that uh, net zero 2030 plan making. Uh, but in addition, I mean, reaching net zero uh, in, is that's a big, that's a big goal. And what I mean by net zero in case people are not familiar with is um, renewably producing um, all the energy that you uh, use uh, you don't have to do this alone. Uh, we, the city, would love to help. Um, hope that you end up um, also potentially uh, in increase the capacity that you need to make that happen. Uh, I also just uh, want to say that uh, reaching net zero is not going to happen by accident. It, you're not going to stumble into uh, reaching that goal it needs to be a formal commitment, uh, particularly because it is going to take a while. And uh, so I'd, I'd urge you to make a uh, commitment to going down the path of reaching net zero energy by 2030. And uh, 
I know the, the Earth Group is going to be presenting more, so I'm going to leave uh, more for them to say. Um, just wanted to add my voice uh, in support of, of their cause. So thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Great. Thanks, Anne, and thanks for the um, very helpful email and information. Um, any other public comment? I'm not seeing any. Um, um, let's do consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move that we approve the consent agenda. Uh, do you have a second? I'll second. Great. Thanks. Uh, any discussion? Yep. Um, Jerry. Hi. Uh, Jill. Hi. Uh, Kristen. Hi. Uh, Andrew? Hi. Uh, I'm again. Hi. Um, Emma? Hi. Amanda? Yeah, hi. Uh, Mia? Hi. Great, I think I got everyone. Um, so next is uh, the Zero Energy student presentation. And I know that I coordinated with Molly Hutton on that, but I'm not sure, I don't see her and I'm not sure if she's one presenting. So um, Ruby, is that you? Yeah, I'm presenting. Great, um, thank you. I will but, share and, my screen. Great, and <laughs> please introduce yourself as well. Okay, and thank is you there any way you can allow me to present my screen? Uh, Libby, can you do that? Make her co-host. Or Anna. You should be good, Ruby. Try again. Okay. One second. Can everyone see this? Okay, so I'm Ruby Bryant. I'm a senior at Montpelier High School, and I'm also part of the Earth Group. Um, and Erin. Yeah, sorry. I'm Erin Kelly. I am also a senior at Montpelier High School and a member of the MHS Earth Group. Thanks so much for listening to our point of view. And we're here to propose the adoption of a net zero policy for the school district. Just to begin and sort of introduce um, who we are as a club, as we are student representatives from our club. Um, the Earth Group is a club in Montpelier High School uh, with students who are dedicated to increasing sustainable practices at our school by decreasing our ecological footprint, um, as well as in the community. And these pictures sort of showcase some of the things and the projects that we've done in the past, um, including refillable water bottles, reusable bags, managing the composting at um, the high school, doing activism um, at the state house, all sorts of things that are meant to reduce our ecological impact as a school. Okay, so our ask tonight for the school board is to adopt a net zero energy 2030 policy for the school district. And this will also direct staff to report annually on progress towards this goal, including electricity, heat, and transportation energy. And this will be able to happen by establishing a renewable energy committee um, within the school board to support the staff um, in this goal. Um, the net zero policy for the district would include producing or offsetting all of our energy needs um, from renewable sources by 2030. 
Uh, and this would align with the accompanying goal for the city of Montpelier. And as Anne mentioned earlier, um, the city of Montpelier is excited about this and they're definitely um, willing to help and really wanting to get the schools to sort of sign on, I guess. Um, this net zero policy would include looking at thermal energy, which is like making the buildings more efficient, transportation energy, like transportation energy, like cars, buses, et cetera. Like how do we get students to school? Um, and electric energy, which our electric energy is already um, pretty good because we're connected to Green Mountain Power, which has a net zero plan of 2025. And then another very large part of this would be moving away from heating with oil. Okay, so this graph shows the energy use by type for the whole city. And as you can see that um, the oil is at 32%, which is pretty high um, compared to the others. And if we did adopt this plan for the school, we would be able to reduce our oil as a district, which would then create the oil slice and for the city to be smaller too. And you can see all of the green um, slices are renewable, but our goal is to create everything to be renewable. So by adopting a policy for our school district, we would then contribute to the city and become a better part of the community that way too. And just as a note, this um, graph is municipal buildings and the school district. It's not the whole city like um, homes, residential buildings or businesses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then this graph is the fossil fuel use by building within the city, which is also the municipal buildings. And you can see in here that the schools overall have a large part in this graph. Um, nearly 25% of the thermal fossil fuel use comes from heating MHS alone. And 40% is the result of heating MHS, MSMS, and UES, which is a large part of the city. And so we think that it's really important to include the schools in the net zero plan that is already happening for the city because you can see how big of a part it is. And also on the graph, you can see that the water resource recovery facility also has a large part, but there is um, something happening right now where they will be heating um, their building using the methane that they're producing. So that will be renewable and thermally net zero. So that slice will go away. And hopefully if we adopt this plan, all of the schools will go away too. Um, and also another thing to point out is that UES is um, connected to district heat, but this year they decided to um, burn oil and I'm not sure why. So normally that slice would go away too. Um, and another part of this is that Roxbury was not included either. So that would become part of it too. But overall, this just shows how big of a role um, us as a school district play in the whole city of Montpelier. Um, so we also wanted to address why we as students really um, care about this and care about reducing our um, ecological footprint and particularly our carbon emissions. Uh, climate change directly impacts our futures and as young people, climate change directly impacts our futures. And quite frankly, it is directly impacting our now, as we can see globally with, you know, everything that's happening in Texas right now. Um, but also um, locally, we've been having a several year drought in the summertime. Uh, so it, it really is already affecting um, our lives currently. And we really feel that we need to play a part in our broader community. Um, we feel that we have an obligation to repair and prevent more damage to our earth. Um, and this is a way that we can make change locally and globally. It will, by um, adopting a net zero policy, we can create a secure, secure reliable and sustainable um, energy and like people say, like the sun will always shine, but there won't always be oil around. And we can also lead by example and encourage others to follow um, locally and 
nationally as well. Um, and we really also care about the 2030 goal because um, science says we have to keep, science says, um, there have been reports, 2019 reports, I don't know the 2020 numbers, but every year it honestly gets pushed closer, um, of we need to keep our global emission, our global temperature under 1.5 degrees Celsius, and the deadline for that really is 2030, as if we can um, decrease our emissions a certain percentage by then globally. And this is also the picture on the right here is a picture of the global student walkout for climate change in 22 years ago at the Vermont State House. It was, um, and it sort of shows that there really are so many students that care about this um, within our school because a lot of these people were from MHS, but also across the whole community and uh, across the whole world. So, the, with adopting this policy, there will be many benefits that follow. One is um, the it will reduce wasted energy. So, if we are able to tighten up our buildings and make them more efficient, we won't have to use as much energy to heat them, which will then bring the cost down for heating all the buildings. Another thing is minimizing greenhouse gases that are emitted into the atmosphere. If we're if we're not producing any carbon, then we won't be contributing to the global warming in the atmosphere. Um, and another thing is it increases our energy security. So energy security is the availability of energy sources at an affordable price. And by combining renewable energy, energy efficiency, and conserve, conserving our energy, we'll be able to have more control over the overall cost of the energy as a school district. And also it will be cheaper in the long run. Um, it may seem like a lot of money now and a lot of work, but the cost of not doing it is much worse than actually doing the plan and following through with it. And um, I also think it's really important to know that it, this is very urgent. And if we don't do it, then we will have much larger costs than um, in the future and even coming up sooner. Um, we, when putting out feelers for this policy, were told that it was going to be impossible. Um, but we think that this, we know that this is not true. Um, and we think that this mindset sort of hurts the process. We understand this will be expensive. It will be a lot of energy and a lot of work that needs to be, um, put into this project, but, as young people, this is our future and this is our now. And we really feel that we can't ignore climate change. Um, and we also feel that because this is something that so many of our students care about, uh, the school board should represent the student body and have our interests in mind in undertaking um, this policy. Um, Excuse me. Um, we know that this mindset of impossibility means that we will never get there, which is sort of like this mindset of impossibility is saying we're never going to get there, which is sort of setting us up for failure. Um, but we know that we already have the technology. We already have the um, like we already have the technology. It's really like we need to get the willpower to really start this. Like people put us on the moon in less than a decade and we have COVID vaccines in less than a year. Um, so we really just need the will uh, around this. And we do think that our 2030 year is, we think that maybe that's one of the things that uh, feels risky, but we really do want to say again, like it is important to have the goal at 2030 and to start this as soon as possible uh, so that we're able to get there because 2030, like it's the deadline essentially. Um, and we also ask like the worst case scenarios, we miss a deadline, but we also 
this is why we think that creating a subcommittee is important to support this work and to um, really get it moving. Okay, thank you so much for listening to us. And I will either send the link in a chat or email everybody the actual policy that we have um, created. And we also are welcoming any questions if you have any too. Yeah, no, thank you so much for, for that. That was a great report. And I completely agree that climate change is the challenge of um, our generation and certainly yours. I know that, that um, uh, we will see some of the impacts, but but you will be left with the major impacts, especially if we don't act and act quickly. And I completely agree that the the school district needs to do do all it can do to um, not just enable you to to be you know great change makers and advocates, uh, but also to to play our part in terms of reducing emissions. Um, I'm sure we have a lot of questions. I see three already. Um, Andrew. On you. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. And thanks, Ruby. And uh, is Erin still with us? I don't I don't see her on the screen anymore. Um, so first of all, I just want to say we hear you on this. We appreciate you. And this is an issue for all of us. Uh, we certainly need to do a better job of not only monitoring our energy use and where we are in addressing this issue, but we should be striving to really drastically reduce our greenhouse gas impact. So I don't think you're dealing with a board or a district that's going to approach this with an impossibility mindset. Um, but I think this board does need quite a bit more information. And later this meeting, we are going to be talking about a committee that in part will be focused on the issues that you brought up. And one of the things that we're going to be proposing, and this is a question for you, is um, for this committee to meet with the student earth group on a quarterly basis. Is that something that you think would be helpful? Definitely. I think meeting with students as often as possible will definitely be beneficial because I think sometimes as students, it's not as hard or it's a little bit hard for us to get things going, but with you guys there, it can be definitely helpful for us. And I think it'd be beneficial on both sides to have our point of view from where we're at in school and just in our point of life and also you um, who can help us as well. So I definitely think that would be helpful. Great. One, one other thing, because I realize we have other board members who have questions and comments is we are participating in the city's energy audit. And I think that's gonna be really, really helpful uh, for all of us, students, teachers, the board, certainly administrators to understand where we are. And my general thinking on this and others can weigh in is once we have that information and we really understand where we are, we should adopt a policy based on that information. And maybe 2030 is the time, but I do agree this is an urgent matter. And I think this board, I don't want to speak for everybody, but my, my understanding of this board is that the board will want to act swiftly on this. So Thank you for coming to us with these issues. Absolutely. Um, Thanks, Jim. Um, and um, I also want to echo Andrew's sentiment that um, uh, the, the I feel and I feel the boards um, uh, feel the same way that we we do need to address this issue, um, and and we are very receptive um, to this. Uh, I also want to uh, mention that it was a great presentation. It's good to see the students uh, leading this and, and coming up uh, um, to us and to administrators and to board to, to um, request uh, that we act on it. So uh, it's really nice to see that. A um, couple of questions I had. One was the data source for, the, for your charts and for your um, graphs. Um, can we get the sources or where you got the data from? Uh, yeah, that was, that? yeah, I will email the board afterwards all of the um, documents that we use, and I'm pretty sure that was from the Energy Committee for the city. Okay, cool. Um, and uh, uh, the there were a couple of, 
uh, slices uh, for district heat. One was the renewable, one was not. Um, can you talk about that? What's the, you know, where, where does that come from? Or what's, uh, what's uh, considered a, a renewable district heat and what's not? I think that we, sorry, I, um, Anne would have more information on this, but I do believe that the renewable district heat is wood pellets. Um, and I think that there is still a portion of district heat that may be heating on oil. Uh, but I don't know exactly what the non-renewable part of district heat is. Okay. Well, again, as I said, um, great presentation. Thank you for coming to us with this. Um, it's, it's really good to see uh, the initiative uh, coming from, from the students itself because they're the ones who are going to get affected the most um, in the long run. Yep, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Advocate. Uh, Mia. I mostly just wanted to say thank you. Um, I'm just really impressed with that presentation and feel a, a deep sense of gratitude for your leadership on this issue. So, so mostly I wanted to say thank you. I <clears throat> My question is more for the board. And Andrew, I think you answered it mostly, but I wanted to just make sure that I understand how we would go about um, responding to this request. And, you know, we may not do the full, exactly what they're asking for, but it, um, it sounds like we would first have a buildings and facilities, um, committee investigating the information of the, re the report that's going to come out of the energy audit and then use that and they would share that with the policy committee and the policy committee is where the policy would get drafted. Is it yeah. possible that, that the policy committee could get started before on, on this, at least, you know, some of the research or whatever, or I don't know, it just, I, I don't want this to get all like mired in process, but I also want to make sure we have our ducks in a row and, and do this smartly. Yeah, I mean, my later on in this meeting, I don't, I don't want to necessarily take away from this presentation, but I think the idea of a facilities and energy committee, I have a list of various responsibilities that we can discuss associated with that. But generally, when we have a policy that impacts, for example, a, a budget policy, generally the finance committee is involved with the policy committee in coming up with that. So, um, I mean, I, I don't see why. Jim, any thoughts on process for pulling together a policy on this? Are, are my my general thought right now is that we don't we need information, and we're going to be getting a lot of information on this. We're meeting with Andrew Larosa next meeting and getting a really deep dive in a way that the board has never really received before because the district didn't have this information on all of our facilities. And then the meeting after that, we're meeting with. Kate Stevenson from the Energy Committee to discuss these issues further. So this is something that we're going to be focused on over the next several meetings. And we're going to be talking about creating a committee that I think pretty much meets the request, that part of the request that the students and Anne brought to us this evening. Um, the, the issue of the policy and how we come up with that and what, you know, how we go about that is, you know, I think that's up for discussion. Yeah, okay. no, I, I think um, I think we can get both processes started. I think it's good to, yeah, I, I think realistically, kind of the three things the district would have to do to have, you know, a net zero by, you know, 2030 um, or, you know, and, and I think we'd want to see if, if 2030 or 2035 is a date. The biggest thing is most likely a bond to, um change the heating okay. systems in our three buildings. Because I mean okay. the the chart, you know, you know, Aaron and, and, and Ruby, the chart you provided really says how much of a of our carbon chunk is from heat and, and all three of our buildings, well two of our buildings um are heated with uh I believe a, a pretty old oil system. Um 
you know, and, and the high school in particular is a, a big emitter. So, so there would have to be a bond to, to, you know, to change the heating systems there. And my guess is that is probably not an inexpensive venture, mm -hmm. uh, but it's certainly something we could do, but we'd have to go to the public with it. But the, uh, the institutions are electric buses and, um, you know, some sort of right. uh, carbon buy down. Uh, and I think we'd also have to get a sense of, of, you know, accounting, um, you know, what, what do we count as, as district emissions, um, and then figuring out a way to, to tackle them. But I, th I think the policy committee could definitely get started on, you know, sketching out what we feel our goals are, um, and, you know, the best way to, to achieve them. I, I think you're also going to hear from Andrew La Rosa next week, and he'll be the, he'll be able to answer these types of questions better than anybody else is, you know, a comment he made to me a while back was essentially that, you know, we could have all, we could have great renewable energy resources, but would still be heating the outside um, of a number of our buildings. And so obviously weatherization yep. is going to be a huge component there. And with some really old buildings, you know, we'll have to ask him as to what that would entail. Um, and, and frankly, we, we also need to keep in mind some of those types of renovations, the amount of time that they would take, you know, we don't have any space to shift students around right now. So I'm not certain what that would mean in terms of where students would be educated, um, like how long certain retrofits would take. So that's going to have to be factored into this too. Like if we were going to have a, a Got it. we need to have a strategy in place. So, so just one follow-up question on the process. Do we need to make a motion to say instruct or ask the policy committee to begin to look at setting a um, a, a, a zero a net zero policy? Do we need a motion for that? I guess is all I'm asking. Or can it just happen? I think it can just happen. I think we can just okay. do it. But I, I yeah, we could also make. Um, you know, a, a motion would be appropriate too, but it's, um, I don't think we made a formal motion with other major policies like, you know, the diversity policy. Uh, we just kind of had a consensus that it was, it was going to be a priority of, of the policy committee. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah. And another thing to kind of think of in the picture too um, is, you know, we do have the yearly um, capital fund, um, you know, and, and thinking about how to spend that too. Uh, Amanda. Thanks, Jim. Um, thank you so much for a great presentation. Um, I, I uh, thank you. And I just want to ask, because that is perfect segue to what I was thinking is like, because this might be expensive and we're going to need the public support. What kind of work are you doing with the public right now? So that, you know, things like this that are need to be also grassroots space where like you have the backup of all the community in Montpelier as well to push this uh, in both ways where um, so what kind of work is happening around the education in our community as well um, well right now I know because the city has adopted a net zero plan for 2030 I know that overall the people who like run the city and are higher up are definitely involved and are willing to back us up on this. And I know people in the Earth Group and people within MHS are definitely involved and want this to happen. And I think it's just a matter of kind of making sure that the public knows what's going on and knows that there is are these plans in place and um, will support the school being involved with it too. Yeah, and um, in general, has, has been having a little bit of trouble doing public outreach this year. Um, in particular, you're breaking up a little, Aaron. Trying to, um, in our meetings make plans on how we can like 
Yeah, and you're breaking up some. Maybe if you turn your video off, it would give you a little more bandwidth. Um, That's better. What the Earth has been having some trouble creating public outages here with difficulties around COVID, but. Yes, I always forget to do that. Um, the Earth Group has been having a little bit of trouble doing public outreach this year just with COVID. It's hard to actually you know, go out into the public. Um, but we have been working on in our meetings, like trying to figure out ways that we can um, get different like engagement things that are accessible um, different educational engagement things that can be accessible by um, anyone on top of our other projects Thank you Erin um, oh, yeah, Thanks Erin uh, Thank you for, for doing all. Totally, I support you and I support this work and look forward to learning more. I am not um, really intertwined, just to be honest, not very into intertwined to the climate justice uh, work. So I'm going to have a lot to learn and I look forward to learning with you. Great. Um, Emma. So yeah, thank you, Ruby and Aaron. Um, I'm very impressed with all the work that you've done and um, and just thankful that you're putting this level of action uh, to your beliefs. So thank you. Um, I agree that I think the board is supportive. I, there's, I had two questions. The first is for you guys, um, why, why do you, did you look into why MHS is using so much more heat or oil than the other two schools? I just wasn't sure. That's That was a surprising data point for me. I am not sure. I didn't really look into that part. I just noticed that it was a huge part. Um, it may have to do with the size. I mean, I know UES is a pretty big school too, but MHS is also big. I'm not really sure, but I can definitely look into that. Okay. Yeah, I would be interested in knowing... Um, but it's not, <laughs> it's it's no rush on that. Um, uh, and, and we can obviously have Andrew LaRosa look at it. Uh, yeah. So then my second question is more along the lines of what Mia was talking about. I feel like sometimes, you know, democracy can be slow and the students prepared this presentation and they're coming with an ask. And I think it would be nice if there's something that the board can do tonight to sort of formalize our support for the students, um, because it's pretty clear to me that the majority of us, you know, agree and support that we should move in that direction. And so I guess just process wise, is there something that we could do, maybe pass a resolution or something like that? Um, I was really inspired by Anne's email that really laid out this like plan of here's how it actually could look if you, um, if you adopted a goal by 2030, these are the steps that you would need to take each year to move steadily towards that goal. And so sometimes stuff like this can feel really big, but I think also the point of sort of setting the goal will move us closer to that, even if we don't end up meeting it by 2030. Um, so is there something that we could do tonight to sort of formalize our support? I mean, I think absolutely. I mean, I think one thing we do is, you know, kind of what Mia suggested, which is, you know, just formally charge the policy committee. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we have a new buildings um, and facilities committee with, with, with shaping a path forward on this. I, I have a question that kind of builds on yeah, Emma's question. Uh, Go for it. That builds on Emma's question. And I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Ann Watson. I, I'll, I'll let you fin 
finish eating what you're eating. I apologize for this, but since you're here and you're such a great resource, kind of bridging the the city and the schools. Um, and I know you've been, Ann and I served on the energy committee together like seven, eight years ago. Um, and Ann, would you mind just explaining to, to us how the city got to that goal of 2030 and when that was put into policy? How did this work at the city level? Sure, thank you. That's a great question. Uh, the city council adopted um, a net zero policy, just generally speaking, uh, in 2014. It really did not have any specificity uh, beyond beyond that. And we, we came to realize that we, we needed those specifics. We needed those targets for ourselves. And so we ended up adopting a formal policy written out with clear goals uh, in 2018. And so that uh, had three parts to it, um, which are some of, some of them anyway are, are similar to uh, what the, the students talked about, um, particularly in terms of, of data collection. Um, there, was, there are other like different things like that the staff should um, look at uh, aligning their practices with net zero, um, uh, with a net zero goal. You know, for example, aligning a, a purchasing policy uh, with net zero, that kind of thing. Um, and so... We, uh, we adopted uh, the 2030 goal um, in 2018, um, mostly because um, that was, that was the, the time frame that we were aware of that, you know, things really needed to be um, significantly changed by then. Um, and actually, as a part of that, we do have a, a goal uh, to reach net zero energy for the entire community by 2050, um, knowing that we had much more control over our own um, facilities and our own operations, we felt we could do that by 2030. And can, would you mind just explaining, number one, how long did it take to develop that policy and, and what kind of process did you, did you use? Yeah, so we uh, mostly, uh, it came from the energy committee once it became clear that we needed to have this policy, it, it didn't take very long to develop it. I think it was less than a year, uh, a matter of months. Uh, it was really a, a matter of determining what pieces needed to, to be there and then sort of formalizing the language. Yeah. Thanks a bunch. And, and did you have several city council members work on that as well as city staff working with you on that? We did have uh, city staff representation uh, on the committee, and uh, I think I, I was also on the committee, uh, but I, and I think there might have been one other city councilor who was a part of it, uh, but it was mostly the energy committee. Thanks yeah. so much. Yeah. Uh, Alana, is your hand still up, or is that from before? Sorry, that's an old hand. Great. Any other questions for um, Aaron or Ruby or Anne as well? Yeah. Thank you so much. This is this is great and important work. It was a fantastic presentation, um, and it is a topic the board, you know, as I think Emma and me have suggested, um, you know, as we put our committees together. Um, will likely put some some meat on the bones of, of trying to flush a path forward because um, yeah I think the 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 graphic that really stood out to me is is how big a portion of the total um, citywide emissions is is related to the the district um, and it's it's quite substantial um, so thanks again and uh, we appreciate all the amazing work uh, so much so much of our great work uh, originates from students, and we really um, are so thankful for it. Uh, can, I, can I just, sorry, yeah, I just have to say, because it's, not, it's gonna be in here, just keep us, keep us, you know, keep coming back, you know, it's like, this type of the work, it's like, keep coming back and, and pushing and knocking and don't give up, and thank you for all you're doing. So, thanks, Anne, and all of you. Yes. Thank you. Um, 
Um, so next item of business is uh, reorganization. Um, uh, Olivia, it might be easiest after we do the officers, if you can just put the the committee page up so we can see. Jim, I think Emma has her hand up. Oh, sorry, Emma. Sorry, I'm just, I just wanted to revisit, you know, is there something that we can do for the students tonight as like an official nod of support for them? Like if we wanna, I see Mia has her hand up, maybe she has a motion ready to just officially set it in stone that we're gonna be moving forward on this work. Yeah, I was thinking before we assign work to committees, we should probably form them. Um, like right now, we don't have a buildings and facilities committee, so um, I was thinking of forming the committees first, and then and then giving them a task along these lines. Does that make sense procedurally? I'm not sure about procedure. I just want to make sure we do something before the students have to hop off. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean we can. It's just it's just I'm not sure we can assign. Well, you can definitely assign the policy committee, and then we can assign the buildings and facilities committee um, later. I, I mean, I, it sounds like Emma, what, what you're thinking is we just you're thinking just a motion to make a resolution that the school board is is going to organize and focus our energies on achieving net zero for the district. In yeah, in in swiftly. Does that does that seem reasonable? I I'm I'm just I'm just speaking off the cuff. Mia, do you have something that you were thinking? I I was just going to say we we um I move we ask the policy committee to begin investigating and researching a policy a, a net zero policy for the district. I don't think we have to put a timeline on it. So that's my motion. Is just the policy committee can figure that part out, but just to get something going. Um, so that it's it's reflected in our minutes, and and that way that the policy committee has that to come back to and say, oh, that's right, we're we're now charged with this. That's my motion. Yeah, perfect. A second. A second. Uh, any discussion? No. Um, Jerry. Hi. Uh, Kristen. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Anakin. Aye. Emma. Aye. Amanda. Yay. Aye. Mia. Aye. Jill. Aye. I think that's it. Great. Um, thank you for that, Emma. And we we'll probably also want to do something with the the Buildings and Facilities Committee, assuming we form one. Um, all right, um, so let's move on to reorganization. The first action item is I have to appoint four officers, chair, vice chair, parliamentarian, and uh, secretary clerk. Um, I'm certainly willing to be chair again. I think Andrew is willing to be vice chair. Um, Jill emailed me and said she was willing to be parliamentarian. Um, and Jerry, I don't want to put you on the spot, but are you interested in being clerk again? Um, Can you explain what parliamentarian is, please? The parliamentarian is um, basically makes things we do things procedurally correct, uh, which requires um, some sort of working knowledge of Robert's rules. Um, that's that's pretty much it. So if you have any questions about, you know, for instance, you know, how we make a motion or, you know, when we have to have discussion after a motion, et cetera, um, the parliamentarian is, is supposed to have those answers. So, um, that's that's the primary function. My, my understanding of it is it's it's the person who makes sure that when we 
want to take action that we actually do take action because if we don't follow the rules, we have to come back and take action again or our actions aren't actually achieved uh, because of the way that the laws are structured. Um, so that's how I view it. And I also view it kind of as like bump, like bumpers for us. Like if you imagine like bowling, like kind of bumpers so that we don't um, unintentionally have like an executive session uh, hiccup type thing, you know, when we, we make sure that we're going into things like executive session, we're going in for, for an authorized purpose and that we do it in a manner that is consistent with, um, with the state laws. So that's how I view it. Yep. No, it's, it's someone who makes sure we follow proper procedure and, and, um, and, Thanks. So, um, I think Mia's of, hand is up. Huh? Mia's hand is up. Oh, Mia. I, um, because you mentioned um, that Jerry, the position of clerk, I have a question from the the ballot that I just <laughs> voted in um, or you know on. There was a position of district moderator, district clerk, and district treasurer. Is that the school district? Are those roles within the school district? Yeah, they're by statute that we have to have, and they they work with Grant in the business office. Oh, okay. So w what would be the difference between the district clerk that everybody just elected and Jerry, if Jerry is a, um, voted by us to be the clerk? Jerry would be the board elected clerk. And if I'm not mistaken, Jerry, that means very little, but you can. That means, that means basically I go like this to Anna. Because <laughs> Anna takes, Anna take, takes care of all the documents for the most part. And really it's, you know, have at it. If anyone else wants to do it, there's not much to do. It's budgetary versus like the board meeting operations, I think. Yeah. So the, the, the district treasurer and the clerk have, someone has to sort of formally be that role for the district. So, so Grant sort of checks in with that person and says, can you verify what I've? Yeah, there are certain times during the year that Grant talks to, talks to the people who are elected. It doesn't happen often, but there are certain times during the year that he does for certain, certain pieces. Great. Yep. And for reasons I've, I've never fully understood, those were positions that that needed to occur when we merged with Roxbury because we became a slightly different entity than we were when we were just Montpelier. And those positions were required. And um, yeah, they're 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 kind of very they, they don't uh, they serve a function, but. Um, it's more for the administrators. Um, Got it. The and we didn't elect anybody to moderator. Do, do we need to go out and find a moderator, or is that do we, are we going to survive without one? I'm not positive what a moderator does for us. So even Great. when we had one, they didn't do anything. So I'm not I'm not overly worried about not having. Okay. One. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I asked for about people that to have town meetings in like. Uh, the moderator in the time. oh, okay. If we had had, I, I see. Okay, got it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, and when we we first formed, we did have a moderator, and the moder moderator formed us when we were like, because yeah, when we created the new district, we had to start from like absolute scratch. So the moderator was the one who basically officiated the creation until. Um, because when we first formed, we didn't have anything. We didn't have any policies. We didn't have any, yeah. So, so we had a moderator who was an attorney in town. Um, and, and then, you know, since then, I, I don't think we've had a position. And I'm not sure we need one. And Pietro hasn't yelled and screamed uh, about it either, has he? Yeah. Um, any other any other questions? Yeah. 
Um, I'd like to make a motion. Great. Um, I move we elect Jim Murphy to chair, Andrew Stein to vice chair, Jill Remick to parliamentarian, and Jerry Huck to clerk. Great, thank you. Uh, do I have a second? I second. Uh, second from Amanda. Uh, any discussion? Great, Jerry. Aye. Uh, Kristen? Aye. Uh, Andrew? Aye. Anakin? Aye. Um, Emma? Aye. Uh, Amanda? Yes, aye. Uh, Mia? Aye, and thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jill? Aye, thanks. I think that's all the votes. Um, for committee assignments, um, I think we can do them all at once once we kind of figure out. Uh, Jill. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I pulled, I was waiting till you're done your sentence at least. I didn't know if at some point we can introduce ourselves to Kristen and just hear from Kristen. I, I welcome and thank you for, for being on here. Yes. Yeah, no, thanks for thanks for raising that. Um, so how about this? Why don't we hear from Kristen while Libby, if you can, if you could pull the committee assignments up on screen. So I think it might be easier just to <laughs> see the current makeup and who's on them. Um, so everyone just has that visible. Great. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, Kristen Gettler. I am a fairly new Roxbury resident. I've only been in town here for especially relative to some of my neighbors who are very generational and have been here for a long time. Um, so I've only been in town for about three years. Um, and myself and my partner and my young daughter are here. We bought a leaning old leaky farmhouse and uh, are busy at work. We have um, a traditional Japanese organic shiitake uh, mushroom operation that we have here at our house that is just like a fun little side hustle. Uh, that's sort of like our, you know, one of our night shift jobs. Um, and yeah, let's see, I've been in education in one form or another for about 15 years. Um, I, for most of that time, I was doing food system education work, um, whether that be um, running an ag and natural resources program at Harvard Union High School for um, a couple of years. I've worked with many different elementary schools in central Vermont, offering educational garden programming, so partnering with teachers and administrators and developing curriculum um, and working directly with students in the classroom. Um, and yeah, and then most recently, um, for the last five years, I've been with CDSU After School. Um, we serve the communities in Northfield, Williamstown, Orange, and Washington. Um, we also offer a program at Roxbury Village School, and I'm the assistant director there. And um, yeah, right now I'm working on a lot of youth voice projects. It was really nice for meeting one for me to see, you know, students taking center stage. Um, that was really um, affirming for me. And um, so I coordinate a youth for youth council project within the CDSU district, and we're doing council work and um, distributing funds to student enacted projects in the community that, the, that youth and students have deemed um, important to having um, communities that understand youth and families and their realities, um, and doing a bunch of uh, work readiness programming and uh, apprenticeship programming um, within after school. And yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Um, this is sort of, I. Literally, this was about a 48-hour write-in campaign that happened when uh, I was nudged by some folks that informed me that there was a vacancy that needed to be filled and that there was a desire to have a parent voice um, at the table. Um, my understanding is that there's going to be some visioning work um, that will take place around Roxbury and how it um, integrates into the district, um, you know, in the, in the impending and coming future. So I'm really interested in that. Like I said, I have a young child who will, will be at RBS for the next four years and then this district for, you know, the next 12 years. So I felt like it was a good time to get involved when it seems like a kind of cardinal direction is going to be set, um, you know, for, for RBS. So I'm really interested to be a part of that. Um, and yeah, this is my first board experience. So I have much to learn. Um, and so I look forward to you all taking me under your wings and I'm excited too. I feel like this is going to be a real, um, 
just way for me to connect to more Roxbury uh, community members. You know, like I said, we are new here. We've been busy. <laughs> and um, I feel like this is just going to be a great way for me to um, get to know my neighbors more and hear from them and make sure that their voices are represented here um, by me on the board. So um, I'll, that's, I'll leave it at that for now. But thank you so much for the warm welcome. I appreciate it. You had my husband at Mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> he's in the background. Uh, yeah. she's, she's good. She can stay. Season is upon us. I will happily talk to talk. My husband is actually, um, he is the true mycologist in the house. Um, so you don't want me to take you on a foraging walk through the woods. He's the guy, but um, yeah, I know a thing or two about growing shiitake for sure. He's a beer brewer, and I'm sure he could get a nice <laughs> range to react. Oh, yeah. yeah, I won't fight it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's awesome. And thank you so much for stepping up. Um, we're looking forward to, to serving with you and um, to meeting you in person, hopefully sooner rather than later. Uh, yeah, and as you may know, once we return to um, in person, uh, we have every fourth meeting uh, in Roxbury. Um, obviously, we haven't been doing that virtually, but we, uh, we, we get out there um, you know, every other month. So, um, yeah, so Libby, are ready to share the committee screen? Jim, Jerry has her hand up. Oh, sorry, Jerry. That's all right. I just wanted to really thank Kristen for being a, a sport and um, taking it on at, like she said, the 11th hour. And uh, it all happened pretty quick, and she's been great. So I really want to thank you for being open to that. I've been saying if I had more time, I might have talked myself out of it. So it was probably a sweet spot. It's, <laughs> good, it's good, good that we got you at the 11th hour then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I like continuity, so it's great. Um, so let's take a quick look at committees um, and... So here's the here's the just a Google Doc with the committees, but I also want to make sure the board is aware that all of your information is on the school board page of our website. And so all of this information is also on this website and you can click any one of these and and uh, hopefully it clicks. <laughs> no, it's it's waiting <laughs> up here. We got the circle of that. You can see the members and you can also see meeting agendas in the minutes all on all on the website so Anna keeps that up to date pretty well but here's in a Google Doc right here take Ryan off of here yeah so um so should we start with the fun one negotiations <laughs> It is fun. Uh, uh, yeah, Jim, I think because we have Kristen and some of us are also not so. Uh, Neil, can you just give it the committees? Can you give a description of each of the committees as we go? Yeah, I will just I'll, I'll just give a quick overview of kind of the committee structure in general. Um, we have, I believe, six committees that. Um, do a slightly just either they are tasked with a certain um, a certain task or they uh, kind of do work that they then bring back to the board just because a lot of the the work um, you know just can't take place within the confines of a meeting. Uh, so the committees we have we have the negotiations committee. Um, a big part of the board's work is negotiating contracts with our three unions, um, the teachers, and then uh, uh, basically the IAs, et cetera, and then we have a union that covers everyone else, including you know, custodians, uh, food service workers, et cetera. Um, it seems that 
lately we've been negotiating a lot of short contracts. So, uh, you know, the work of, of those committees seem relatively constant, but uh, essentially what the negotiations committee does is the negotiations committee does the direct negotiations with representatives from the union, uh, works out tentative deals, and then brings that back to the board uh, for approval. Um, negotiations committee can be a fair amount of work, uh, particularly if there's you know several negotiations going on at once and negotiations are, are complicated. Um, the removal of healthcare from the district's purview to the state has, I think, significantly uncomplicated some of the negotiations. The negotiations could be pretty intense when they were about healthcare, uh, but it's still, um, yeah, it's 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 very important work. But but that committee can can be a, a time commitment. Uh, the finance committee meets quarterly. Um, it basically gets a deep dive from our. Uh, business manager uh, about the finances of the school or of the district. Um, the budgets that generally are brought to the, the board um, have a decent level of detail, but uh, not super, super granular detail. And the finance committee looks more granularly at the detail. Um, and if there's any sort of, of, questions or things that uh, the committee feels that the board should be aware about that aren't necessarily in the presentations that the board gets, which are slightly higher level. The finance committee is basically there to um, kind of do an, an overview of that and, and make sure that, that the board is getting uh, the financial information it needs and that there are board members who have a deeper awareness of, of the finances. Um, uh, the policy committee uh, formulates our policy. We have uh, kind of a hybrid structure. A lot of boards are policy governance. Um, we were policy governance until we reformed as the Montpelier uh, Roxbury board. Uh, the the Montpelier the Montpelier board itself previously was was policy governance. Uh, I'm not sure if the Roxbury board was. I believe it was it. Um, we now have a governance by policy board, which is kind of a creation of our own. Um, it follows the, the, the policy governance model generally in that uh, the, board, um, the board does policy. It does not do operations. It does not make, it does not implement decisions, uh, but it sets broader policy uh, for the administration to follow it and, and use as guidance in, in its work. Um, the policy committee uh, works on policies and, and that I think largely entails two things. One, uh, making sure that we have the policies that we're required to have because some policies we're required to have by law and that you know any updates to those policies occur. Um, every three years, we have to revisit our policies and, and renew them uh, you know, as laws change, et cetera. And then to also work on uh, policies that the board wants to have that are not necessarily required by law. Um, you know, for instance, uh, if we have a, a policy as we discussed tonight on net zero emissions, which we've been charged to the policy committee, you know, the charge is basically for the policy committee um, to do kind of the work drafting that and crafting it. So we'll do that and bring it back to the board um, for approval. Uh, the School uh, Safety and Police Relations Committee, that is, um, that is not a permanent committee. That's a temporary committee that has been charged with um, looking at the SRO position, which is work it's already done. <coughs> um, and then also its second charge is to come back, uh, uh, I think, soon uh, with uh, recommendations about uh, you know, policies and goals that the the district can set um, on uh, how we ensure we have a, a safe environment for all of our students and, and how we want to define safety in general. And so a, a special committee would kind of work in that way, like its work might end up going to the policy committee for, um, for action on some of the recommendations that it would take. 
Uh, the superintendent evaluation committee does exactly what the, the title suggests. It, uh, it heads and coordinates the superintendent evaluation process and uh, just kind of uh, one of one of another, you know, the the board does a the really like I think three major important functions. Uh, it sets policy, it approves the budget, and it evaluates the superintendent. The superintendent reports to the board. the The superintendent is the board's only report. All the other reports report to the superintendent, but. Um, the board uh, supervises and evaluates the performance of the superintendent and that committee basically puts, make sure that process occurs, puts parameters on it. The board ultimately approves the evaluation of the superintendent, uh, but a lot of the work of that occurs at the board level. Um, the Main Street Middle School Building Committee, which I think we are gonna probably have a motion to turn into a permanent buildings and facilities committee to look um, at our buildings and facilities issues, including, I think, emissions. Uh, that committee was set up last year. Uh, it's a broader, it, it was set up as a, a broader community committee as well. It has, as does the SRO safety committee, um, the members of the public on it as well. Uh, but it was, it was first set up to look at our Main Street Middle School building, which is a 107-year-old building now that, um, you know, has been chopped up over the years and um, can be expensive. Um, and then the CCC Governance Study Committee, um, we have a representative on that, um, who is Jill, and Jill probably knows more about that than I do, um, but that's a, that's kind of an outside committee that, that we have a representative on. Um, any questions? And I can no longer see the participant list function, so just go ahead and um, Jim, this is Jerry. Um, yeah. Will we be setting up a, a temporary committee to do the visioning for Roxbury? I think definitely. We don't have to do that now. I, I was, I had it in mind of, of just having that probably be a retreat discussion about how we want okay. to, sure. how we want to go about that. Um, Jim, this is Andrew. Do you mind since? We're going to be, people are going to be considering committees. We're going to be considering who's on what committees. If I uh, touch on this proposal related to a facilities committee. Yeah, definitely. Um, so why don't you just go ahead and, and make it because we can wrap that so, up. I think a big yeah, yeah. So, well, let me just explain my thinking here because I'm not really thinking of turning the Main Street Middle School, the Main Street Middle School Building Committee as Jim mentioned, was really a community committee. We had, well, at the time it was one city council member, but two of our members were elected to the city council. So it became three, three city council members, but two, two community members. There were, I think, two board members on it, Libby, Andrew LaRosa. Um, we had student representation, but long story short, I mean, that, that effort needed to be put on pause once COVID hit because we were looking, and, and that building has a lot of assets too. A lot of times I feel like people approach that building from kind of a deficit mindset and, and it, it has a lot of strengths. There's a lot of things to love about it. And once we got in, into the process, we realized that there were a lot of things that students and teachers really valued with that building. That's kind of a side though, because we really don't know what what our buildings orientations are going to be looking like over the next couple of years. So I'm not proposing a community committee. I'm really proposing uh, another board committee. And this came out of a discussion. I met with the energy committee with Libby and Andrew LaRosa, a couple of members from the city's energy committee. And through that conversation, I was talking with Andrew and Libby about how the board could approach this issue and other similar issues. And I have to give credit where credit's due. Libby mentioned that many other districts do have facilities committees. So that's when I thought about, okay, a facilities committee would probably make sense for us. Um, and what I'm really proposing is a facilities and energy committee. And I just rattled these off like literally five minutes before the meeting. Um, it, these are the, the preliminary uh, responsibilities that I'd envision for this committee, and they might be too broad, which is why I think 
uh, whoever gets appointed to this committee, if we decide we want to generally create this committee, we should put our heads together and come up with a formal proposal probably in a month. Um, but anyways, the responsibilities I'm thinking of would, or purposes, would be to bring a general understanding of our facilities and en energy situation to the board. It's something that we're really lacking on the board right now. We saw that when we just had that discussion before. None of us, including myself, really understand where we are with the state of our, our buildings and, and the energy that, it cons that they consume. Um, meet with Andrew LaRosa at least quarterly on facilities issues and to, to get an energy consumption update. Um, be apprised of and participate in the capital plan. The capital plan and our capital fund are pretty new to our district. Well, our district's a new district, but they're, they've only been in existence, I think, three years. And it would be good for, I think, this committee to be apprised and have input into that plan um, with, with the administration, of course. Um, and and the, I envision the administration would really drive that plan. Um, and then, you know, um, sometimes we do will want to look at some facilities planning issues like the MSMS building committee and some one or however many members from this committee could participate there. Transportation issues. We've had a lot of um, we've had a lot of discussions surrounding busing in recent years and we expanded our busing. Uh, we have this upcoming energy audit that we're participating in and we're talking about net zero goals. I'd imagine that this committee would focus on those issues. That would probably, those would probably be some of the first issues. Sometimes we have ad hoc issues. We had a lead, the, the lead issue that the administration was way out in front of the state on several years ago. Um, bonding issues. Uh, I, I'd envision that this this committee would meet with the student earth group on a quarterly basis or at least twice a year. And also at least one person from this committee, I would imagine would liaise with the city energy committee so that our board and the city are, you know, communicating regularly on issues um, surrounding our net zero goals and energy consumption. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so I, uh, to be mindful that we are quite late on Mara's training. I don't want to keep her too long. Do we want to? Um, why don't we? Do we want to come back to committee formation? Maybe let Mara have the training and give some thought to. Um, I think your idea is great. I think just the question is um, making appointments. So why don't people give thought to that while we hear from Mara and then we can come back. And, and finalize this because I don't want to. Um, I don't want to keep her waiting too much longer. Uh, Mia, um, I definitely appreciate that, and I appreciate Mara you sticking with yes. us so far. <laughs> yes. um, well, we're. I'm excited that you're back. Um, I just wanted to put out another idea that maybe we could also be thinking about during Mara's training, which is the, the creation of a board equity committee. Um, I don't have it quite as uh, well thought out as Andrew just laid out, but I would imagine that it um, would serve this a similar function for the board as the district staff committee, um, which has been doing really amazing work. Uh, would, is is doing, and that there would be some liaison liaising between the two, but that um, in order to make sure we're all moving forward in the same direction, um, I was really inspired by the um, the Burlington Equity report that Amanda shared with us a couple of weeks ago, and it it that it occurs to me that that um, takes a lot of uh, of thought and intention to come up with a, a vision like that, and. Um, that is another place where I think our board could um, could play a big role at, in in establishing that, and then figuring out how we continue our measuring our progress toward an end an end goal. Um, and uh, and then I, another idea could be that that the equity committee could be where we hold a progression of trainings, like like the one Mara is about to do um, for us and with us uh, to. Uh, to further develop the the knowledge base of those of us serving on the board and figure out how to help bring in 
new board members because elections happen every year to the equity vision of uh, of the board. So those are initial thoughts that I have that, again, just wanted to throw it out there so for all of us to think on um, the value of having an equity committee for the board. Great. No, great suggestion. Um, Amanda. I think we can continue the conversation after Mara, just I want to respect your time. So. Okay. Um, great. Mara, go ahead. And um, yeah, we will come back to committees. I, I am. I want to express my gratitude that you I, that you are letting me me go. I have my neck hurts, and I really want to go to bed. So, thank yeah. you so much for. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. That's okay. I'm. I don't miss this, but it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I um, I'm really excited to actually get to to see folks and to get to talk to you this evening. Um, I assigned uh, the first two modules of the Kerwin Institute's uh, implicit bias training, and those are really intended just to be kind of a background for like what even is implicit bias and how does it function. But we are going to talk more about precisely the sort of stuff that kind of Mia was getting at there with the equity committee stuff, which is like, okay, you have had a lot of trainings. What are you doing with the stuff that you learn in the trainings? And um, what is the district doing? And there's an equity policy. What is it accountable to? Those sorts of things. So that's uh, kind of the, the tr shape training is going to take this evening. Also, I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of glad there was a big gap between me and the youth because they killed it. And I was like, I do not want to go right after Aaron and Ruby just knocked everyone's socks off. So, um, but I actually will steal some of uh uh, specifically Aaron's uh, words where Aaron addressed the concept of um, whether we approach a problem with an attitude of impossibility versus an attitude of this is going to be really hard and we will find a way to do it. Um, and I also really appreciated her point about will that it requires individual will, collective will, and the strength of that will is actually what determines what gets done and what changes much more than that we, we're interested or aware, right? Awareness doesn't change anything if we aren't going to choose to push to act. So rather than making you aware of a whole bunch of stuff that lots of you are already aware of, um, the awareness part, was the homework, and now we will have the conversation part. And I am wondering if I could have, do I already have co-host capacity for sharing screens? You don't need the co-host. You can just share your screen, or you should be able Sweet. to. Sweet. Excellent. Okay. What would the evening be without a thrilling PowerPoint? I don't even know. I would hate to leave you all in that kind of lurch. So here we go. PowerPoint. This is a statement that I, that I think is a good one to frame how we have to go about getting oriented to what it what we mean by will. Um, so this quote actually comes from uh, some education experts that um, that I'm actually doing some training with at VTHEC. So I am borrowing um, their words that I literally just learned today. And the phrase that I came across here is, what are the skills and knowledge that I need to be a threat to the existence of equity in my sphere of influence. And there are lots of pieces to this and that's why I kind of separated them. Um, oh, I wanted to really, oh, I, will, I will make sure that I mention the names of the two women who did the work because I don't want them to go without recognition. But um, the first piece is, 
what are the th- what are the things you need to know? What are the things you need to be capable of? Um, what are the skills you need to be able to put into process? What are the awarenesses that you need? What is the context that you have to have? So that's the what are the skills and knowledge that I need, meaning uh, us personally, individual people who are on the board. And this is a question that we could encourage other people in the district who are interested in change to think about, like, what are the things that I need as a parent? What are the things that I need as a student? What are the things that I need as a staff member to be a threat to the existence of inequity? And I think that's really powerful, the threat piece. It's what do we need to do to endanger the existence of inequity, to make it ultimately extinct? What do we need to do? And then the last piece is the in my sphere of influence, because obviously we all with different hats. um, I was actually really impressed by Anne kind of giving the list of like, these are the various hats that I wear and therefore the various spheres of influence, influence that I operate in. And so you have a sphere of influence that is here within the board that is with the administration, the way that like liberally, Libby literally is administration. And then the rest of you have d- deep relationship with folks in administration and the sphere of influence of who's your friend group, people that you're friends with in town. What other committees are you on? What other ways do you engage with the school? Do you have kiddos in the school district? Do you have um, nibblings in the district? So this is just a centering question. And the next piece that I want to move to is, do I have the will to be that threat to inequity? Because it is one thing to recognize that that something has to change. It is another thing to drive that change yourself as an individual or as a body or um, as an advisory capacity um, where whatever your area is that you have to influence, do you have the will to be the threat to inequity? And so the conversation that I really want to have right this second, um, and I promise we aren't actually going to go even the whole 40 minutes because this is going to be a kind of a heavy, more emotionally vulnerable sort of training, is what gets in the way of your equity will? What gets in the way of your determination to make things different? If you know that there are really serious inequities and that they've lasted for sometimes hundreds of years and that they're really big, one of the ways that uh, things that gets in the way of our equity will can just be in like an intimidation of size. Like it just feels like it's insurmountable. So that's one of the things that I want to, that's what I'd like to get kicked off here with the conversation. What are some things, and I will offer you, I'm going to give you about 60 seconds to either think or jot, uh, whatever you need to do in quiet processing time. What are things that get in the way of your will to make equity change? And you can think you personally, and you can also think what are things that get in the way of the district's will? Because the district has indicated a will with its policy commitment. What are the things that sometimes get in the way of that will to do something? All right, I will give you 60 seconds now.
kind of wrap up whatever sentence you're on, whatever concept you're jotting or thinking. Um, I would like to give a huge shout out to Emma Bay Hansen, who provided me with the names of the two educators, and they are Marceline Dubose and Tess Ormsis. So uh, really kind of have cracked my own brain open, and I was like, I feel like I, I'm going to share this with the school board because they deserve that kind of brain cracking open awesomeness. So would folks... If you are willing to kind of um, challenge yourself to speak up, can you tell us together some things that get in your way or that you think get in MRPS's way? Yeah, Jill. Oh, did I not say Jill clearly? Sorry. I'm the kid who raises my hand first so that I can rip off the Band-Aid. <laughs> um, That's for legit. Me, <laughs> for me as an individual, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's the sort of insurmountable nature of it. It feels so much bigger than me that I feel I wouldn't know where to start. And then I think for the district, um, well, I, I think our district has come a long way. And I think this year they've certainly... Um, you know, dragged me kicking and screaming into that lens. Um, there's always these sort of competing priorities and emergencies. It's like the best intentions, but then there's grenades being thrown in left and right that really do require immediate attention. So it often, you know, pulls the attention away. Okay. So I hear that there are some concrete things that get in the way, like nobody really planned on COVID that wasn't really in the five-year plan, right? So obviously that there's a kind of hijacking that happens sometimes, but often the hijackings actually only highlight the inequities that, that exist and we haven't had a chance to deal with yet, right? Um, and then it doesn't mean the inequities stop existing. It just means things are worse. Um, and and we're dealing with a house that's on fire, which it doesn't sound super hopeful, but at least as a way to acknowledge like, yeah, it is really hard when urgent things come up and you have to deal with those and nothing else has been completed or finished. And it's a big thing that isn't going to be completed or finished anytime soon. Um, Mia, I think you had your hand up next. Mara. Um, the things that get in my way um, are a really deep-seated fear of conflict. Um, it, it's, um, I don't even know, I don't know if there's more that I can say than that. It's like, I, I know it's like ingrained in me through, um, from childhood on. Uh, in ways that um, are t very difficult to overcome. Um, and and going hand in hand in that is um, a fear of making other people uncomfortable. And if I'm being totally honest, um, other white people uncomfortable, um, if we're talking about racism, because there's lots of other ways to other people, as we know, um, and and making myself uncomfortable. Um, and, and a fear of messing up. I think those are three things that, that get in, in my way in a really big way. Hey, thank you. The, that, I mean, I was not kidding when I was like, this one's going to take a lot of out of you. That's why we're not going to do a really hard, long one. It requires uh, courage and, uh, and vulnerability. And I'm very impressed and excited. So yeah, that is another thing is that we are, we come from a culture where conflict, even subtle conflict, even disagreement at the dinner table is like well, if we can't talk politely about it, then we just won't talk about it at all, right? And so if that ingraining that happens culturally becomes a big deal when all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm supposed to have a conversation about stuff that makes literally everyone in this space uncomfortable and not just uncomfortable, but cringe, oh God, make it stop uncomfortable. That's big. 
And I think Emma had her hand up next. Um, I wrote down that it's it's emotionally exhausting. Um, so it's it's draining. So it's hard to you know knowingly go into a conversation or a process where you know you're trying to make change when you know the path ahead is going to be so emotionally draining. Um, time is always a, a limiting factor. I feel like, you know, everyone's busy and we all have jobs and this is, you know, more often than not, that type of work is volunteer work. And it's, um, it's hard to make time for it. It's hard to justify the time needed. Um, and kind of relating to the like bigness of it all. <laughs> that there's, you're, the work is never done, so there's always more time needed. Um, and then I wrote something similar to what Mia said, just making waves and hurting feelings. And I think that that's something that, um, you know, holds me back, but I think it also holds our society back. Culture, the board, you know, the ta our town, just, you know, we're, we're neighbors and we like each other and you want to be likable and you want to, um, you know, like other people and you want to have good relationships. And sometimes when you go to make change like this and speak, speak out against inequities, it can make people feel uncomfortable and make you feel like you're not likable or mean in some way. Yeah, that's also really awesome. The, the feeling of costs, what is going to be the cost of my investing, my time, my energy, my will, my social capital? Right? What is going to be the cost of making waves, of continually pushing a point? And even of like looking like you're not grateful for all of the amazing things that have already been accomplished, right? Because quite frankly, I am deeply impressed in lots of ways by um, the district's commitment and the, and the steps that it's made. And of course, we know that like it's barely scratching the surface. So it's hard to be in a place where you're like, I see and appreciate the amazing things that we have accomplished and it's not enough, right? So I hear that too. Uh, Jim, I think you were next. Yeah, I think I mean, kind of a lot of, of what's been said already, but I also think there's there's kind of a deep resistance, and I think this is both personally and um, and at a district level to, to some change. I think you can intellectualize that it's needed, but there's also things that people have grown up with tradition, and you know there's been existing practices, and um, like sometimes actually making the changes and, and letting go of some things that, you know, from the time you were little were just kind of accepted as, you know, this is how things are done, uh, can be more difficult for both people and systems than, than people are willing to admit. That makes sense. Thank you for sharing that, Jim. I, I, even, as we, even as we talked about a parliamentarian, I was like, who decided that we do things with parliamentary procedure? And when... And why? Why do we do it with parliamentary procedure? Why is that better than other ways that we could run meetings or make decisions collectively? And but there are laws, and the laws say we have to do things via parliamentary procedure. But who wrote the laws? And who, right? So you like there's this kind of sense of like that's just the way we have to do things. When in fact it's not. It's not the way that you have to do things. We can change. But the immensity, if, if, if you come from a place where your culture is reflected and the things that make sense to you are the things that the vast majority of people do, it, it definitely feels like, why would we do it any other way? Doesn't make sense. And of course, if you're on the outside looking in, you're going, we, do, we don't need to keep doing it that way because everyone else who isn't you right now gets left out. And that, that's why we're seeking the change. Those are big, powerful things. Kristen, I'm going to call on you next. But first of all, welcome to the board. Good job. I'm so proud of you for not thinking it through. 
<laughs> That's the way to do it. A 48 hour turnaround. It's on my side for once. Yeah. Thanks, Mara. Um, I actually took a training with you um, a couple years ago at the. I was going to say, you look very familiar. Yeah, it's one of the most powerful, lasting trainings I've taken to date, for sure. So, nice to see you again. Um, and, yeah, I, what I wrote down was, um, and this initially I thought was kind of like personal and situational, but I think certainly could be um, policy connected. I wrote, um, afraid of endangering who I intended to protect, um, you know, via a misstep. And... Um, you know, I think um, just, I guess, the potential for unintended consequences, um, like, you know, uh, what, how does the saying go? The road to hell was paved with good intentions. <laughs> um, you know, having having the skills and capacity to deal, to I guess, to, to facilitate and um, backlash. Um, and, you know, as a as a white, you know, cisgendered woman, um, you know, I have a lot of social capital to expend and sacrifice. Um, and yeah, and I, and, and yet still, you know, I, I fear making missteps, whether that's saying the wrong thing, saying it the wrong way, you know, there's just, there's just some fear in there. Um, and then, you know, some other folks are mentioning just sort of time. And I think for me, it's like being able to do things really thoroughly and with great integrity is really important to me. And so if you were to, you know, take on something just so important and massive that it just be able to be done really, really well. Um, so yeah, those are the two things that came to mind. That's really big. That I remember, I remember seeing a, um, a triangle on like uh, hiring people to do new construction and like you can have it done well, you can have it done fast, you can have it done cheap, right? But you cannot have it done all of those ways. You get to pick like maybe two, right? So if you're going to do it really well, sometimes it takes time. Well, what about the fact that it's urgent? It is the people who are most impacted do not have time for it to take time. But we also don't want to do it too fast and do it wrong. So those are real fears. Um, and I'd just like to share an anecdote with you. Like, I I ask these hard questions of myself. I spend a lot of time focusing on these questions. And I spent today, um, I had a situation where a, a school called me and said, we have a situation where a kiddo is binding their chest with an ace bandage, which Chest binding is a thing that sometimes people who have body dysmorphia, people who are gender non-binary or transgender, do to try to make their body adhere to how they feel like they need to be inside. And so sometimes they'll try to bind their chest. And there are safe ways to do that, but an ace bandage is not typically among them because you can really do some really scary damage to your ribs you can do really tough things to your lungs. You can really create some big problems for yourself. But the school was in this position where they're like, the parents do not approve of this whole transgender thing. And the nurse does not know anything about binding chests. We've never heard of this before. The guidance counselor knows about it, but we don't give it to the guidance counselor to talk about people's bodies, especially intimate body parts. Where, how do we solve this problem? And we spend a lot of time talking about how do we solve the bureaucratic problems. And we didn't spend time at first talking about this kid is wrapping their ribs in a knot and that's unsafe and unhealthy. And while we're busy thinking about all of the consequences to us, this kid is going to keep harming until a better solution is offered. So sometimes it means that the adults have to forge new paths, have to go places we don't already have policies, have to make decisions that actually maybe fly in the face of the tradition or the expectation of what we're currently doing because the harm is existing right now and we have to fix it right now. And it sometimes means that we got to chuck some other stuff out the window and come back for it in a minute in order to get somewhere. 
And making those decisions is hard. Having that stuff in front of you, like what, what, what if I'm held legally accountable? What if the people come with their pitchforks to the meeting? I've, I've been in a pitchfork meeting or two. Definitely big things to consider and big intimidation factors that can make it really hard to exercise that will to get something done. Awesome, Kristen. And Andrew was next, and then I think Jerry. Yeah, I, th I think on a very, I, I, I initially started this by thinking about the board and also state levels, but it seems like we're talking about this on a very personal level. So for me personally, I, I feel I feel like it's complicated for me because in some ways in a state like Vermont, I feel like I really am. I really am, you know, being being a white cisgender male, I feel like I really am coming from a place of privilege. And I acknowledge that at the same time, I, I definitely grew up in a place where I, I came from a, a, a religious upbringing that that was persecuted, where I regularly um, was on the receiving end of that. And um, I mean, I saw it recently in in Pittsburgh, the synagogue where that shooting occurred is where my parents were married. And um, having lived in a, a city of like 500,000 people where I was the own, me and my partner were the only people that were a different um, ethnicity, but being able to speak the language there, hearing all of that, it made me think so much more about like, what is my role? Um, and, and there were lots of supportive people there, but there were lots of people who in, in those places also really were not happy that I, I was in those places. And I was treated very, very differently um, for several years of my life when living in those places um, in Asia. And um, so that all like kind of colors my view on this. And it's a little it's a little bit complicated for me. But I you know, for me, it's like figuring out my role. You know, how do I support equity? How much to push for change? versus how much to step aside, how to push, if I am pushing for change, how much to speak versus how much to listen, how to speak, how to listen. I'm not an apathetic person, so it's 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 figuring out how how do I how do I support this. Thank you very much for that vulnerability. That's really powerful. And one of the reasons that we're kind of ending up digging into the personal is that our systems are made up of us. We are who is in the board. <laughs> we are who is in the legislature, right? There isn't a way for the, edge the, the board to take an action that the individuals in the board weren't part of forming in their minds and their hearts and their moral compasses, right? So that it's helpful to know that some of the things that we're identifying here in the personal are also the things that make systems resist change or drag their feet a little or be nervous um, or not go as fast as they could or just to be uncertain. And I'm very grateful, thank you, Andrew, for raising all of those pieces that are the constant balance question, the uncertainty of Am I doing too much? Am I doing it the right way? Should I move aside? I know that I can't let those questions stop me from doing things, so I have to keep doing them anyway. But um, someone might get hurt, and what do I do when they get hurt? Because I, I can't just insist on never doing anything because I might do it wrong, and toes might get stepped on, and pain might happen. And those are all things that even the district, even big entities have to worry about in terms of pushing at envelopes. So, wow, wow, wow. Good, good identification. Jared. So, um, I had written some of the things other people wrote, but one big thing I think that gets in the way is language, um, terminology, and part of that is, um, depending on the group you're talking to. So um, I come from a very poor background uh, and to, to talk to very poor people about pain gets tricky really quickly and vulnerability and because they immediately go to um, no one sees my pain. And so Language is really tricky, and I think you have to adjust your language depending on the stakeholders 
or the the people you're you're speaking to, and um, otherwise you you tend to make people defensive, um, and you know you have to you have to meet people where they are, and I think that's really important. And but it's hard to do. It's a really fine line to walk. Thank you for sharing that too. I, I also come from a poverty background and I'm like, I'm literally talking to you right now from rural Western Pennsylvania in my mother's dining room. So um, the, there is that reality of the way that we sometimes feel our pain and our differences and even our joys and celebrations and use them to feel like we aren't like other people or use them to say, like, I'm not getting attention on my thing, on my need. And don't always capitalize on the opportunity to say, I understand some of that difficulty because I'm having this kind of difficulty. What solution can we come up with that becomes feeding two birds from one hand, right? Like, how can we come up with solutions to lots of the inequities that are happening at once. And I will point out that the board is very new since, you know, the past year or so. Um, but Tamar O'Coon's piece that uh, the board worked on within the past year, it's um, on specifically white supremacy culture and what it looks like. The neat thing about that piece is that it's got some actual responses. It has some actual answers, some practices, some ways to move forward. And a lot of those pieces aren't just about white supremacy. A lot of those pieces are about middle class. A lot of those pieces are about patriarchy, right? And so there's lots of different ways that inequity comes into stuff. And if we look even at one lens, like we look through the race lens, Getting practice with a tool that tells you what some of the answers are can help you to create copies of those sorts of answers that deal with bigger situations than only the question of white supremacy and that kind of oppression. Uh, Libby, your hand was up, but now it's not up. Do you want to be up? My hand wasn't up. Oh, it was up for a second, but maybe you did not mean for it to be up. So I will go on. Just a fluke of Zoom. <laughs> I will go on to Mia and then Kristen, and then I will uh, kind of close this question and go to the next piece. Mia. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to kind of piggyback off of something Jim said, and then you followed up on it, maybe put a little bit of a finer point on it, which is the... Um, the traditions and the procedures and the policies and the like the way we do things have because white supremacy is so entrenched in in everything especially institutions and the district is not immune to that as an institution um i think it's fair to assume that that it was through a went a lens of white supremacy that those were all written mm -hmm. and so um those that feels like a really big knot for us to be unraveling and that it's necessary for us to unravel um, as a district. And that's that is like one of the things that just to, you know, directly answer your question feels like it's what gets in the district's way of dismantling white supremacy is white supremacy itself. <laughs> um, and I, I can recall a few years ago when I was working with um uh, my former colleagues on developing our own understanding of these things, we had read some very dense articles about the origins of white supremacy getting woven into our laws. So before we were even a country, and I can remember feeling very um, despondent about that and vocalizing that in this discussion we were having about just like really feeling like I just like throwing up my hands and being like, I don't even know what we can do about this. And one of my colleagues at the time, who's a, who's a black man, said to me, this has been constructed by humans, <laughs> to your point, Mara, it can be destru destructed or deconstructed by humans. So let's get to work. And that's the thing, like, I really hold on to that every time I have that feeling of, like, where do we even go from here? That I, I, that's my reminder. 
That is awesome. I really appreciate that. And it also provides a tie back to this is still a discussion of implicit bias because what implicit bias is, is unexamined operating procedures. That's really what implicit bias is. It's the ways that we go about making decisions or taking actions that we don't always examine and that when we pause to examine, we recognize have bias or have pieces that we didn't intend that cause harm. So I really, that's, that's the, I, I am sure if I, if I were in this training, uh, because I'm a Virgo, I would be looking for keywords and I'd be like, lady, this is not about implicit bias, but I want to create that connection for you that precisely what implicit bias is, is the ways that different identities that we have and different ways that we've been raised and brought into the culture cause us to not look too closely or to just assume that's the way things are or to just assume that we are making intentional choices when in fact lots of things are being decided for us because we we, we're, we have to adhere to a system and so we, there are some costs to that. Just wanted to make sure I was making that implicit bias connection because it is, there's implicit bias that happens in personal level, individual decisions. Uh, there's implicit bias that is always about what's unconscious and what's unexamined, but it's also about collective ways and big picture ways that we don't examine or don't see or even allow our emotions to pull us away from so that when you start to examine it, it feels yucky and you pull back. Those are all things that I want us to, just as we're wrapping up here, dig fingers into because Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools have actually taken a lot of steps that plenty of schools around Vermont, plenty of districts around Vermont have not even tried to take yet. And that is powerful and important. And we're still getting reports from people that, that things aren't equal, that harm's being done. And so we got to keep doing more things. What are you going to do? And another question that I have is, if we know that all of this is stuff, stuff is coming up, we also need to have a conversation about accountability because one of the challenges of implicit bias is if you are the only one holding yourself accountable for things that you can't even see or sense, it gets really, really hard, right? So it's an opportunity and an invitation also to think about what does accountability for the board or for the district or for the moves that you make look like? When you know you yourself and, or those entities themselves are prone to not being able to see some of the things that need to be addressed in the first place. Where does that accountability come in? Who's, who's watching? Who's double checking the work? And who are you producing for? So I just wanted those pieces to also be part of the implicit bias discussion because implicit bias isn't just about being aware that you have bias. It's about trying to course correct and course correcting often requires outside supports and external assistance. And I think, Amanda, you had your, I think you had a hand up. Do you still want to have a hand up? I had it, I turn it off, I had it, I turn it off, I had it, I turn it off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, thank you, Mara, for all these pondering questions. I, I, I think, like, for me, is this idea of, you know, when I look at 2,132 people voted for me, I'm like, yes, I have accountability. Do I am accountable to 2,132 people right now? I'm like, that's who put me here. Before, I wasn't so sure because it was like this. So, like, for me, it's like things that get in the way is also just my lived experience as someone who is doing this work for my life and my kid's life and my nephew's life and my friend's kid's life. It's like this is my life, right? So, like, 
things that get in the way is that it's like that's part of my nature is that I'm fighting for my life and that when that that gets in the way sometimes of this inequity because then you have to go not only it's like here's this white supremacy culture that doesn't see me right because I am a threat I am a threat to inequity uh, just by being me and there's all these things that are in place I also care I am part of the white supremacy culture I also carry biases that I need to work on it's not like one day I woke up and I knew everything about disability no I had to learn about that right like I had to be so for me it's inequities is like uh being the threat and then being threatened by a system that doesn't see me is really hard for me and then when we think about accountability and moving this work is also that I'm in this work because I believe that we have to be agents of change for our kids. So how do we, how, how are we in that, in that same wavelength? Like I come with my biases, I come with my reactions, but here we are because we want the best for our kids in the long term. And like, it's very interesting how, for me, conversations around net zero and environmental policy, which is a very white led movement, you know, it's just like there's zero, there's no braining, but systemic racism that for centuries have just like, and like, you know, it, it, the same with disability and ableism and the same with our folks with uh, from the LGBTI community, all the systems have been in place. It's so hard to like push that. But when it comes to environmental racism, and I'm talking, I'm not just, I'm not talking about the board, I'm talking about like movement wise, is like there is, is very white led, and those are the people that are being listened to. So, like, there is for me, it's just like it's just a lot to to process and being in the space. That that's what gets in the way. So, when we think about accountability, I think like it's having this conversation about how do we put these theoretical things that for some people is theoretical, right? To being like we are humans undoing a system that fucked us all. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, TV. <laughs> <laughs> that messed us all. <laughs> ah, um, this is why these things shouldn't be recorded. But anyways, I I think that it's important that it's like we are here in humanity trying to change a system that is going to leave legacies for many of our children and their children, right? Whether that's environmental racism or whether it's systemic racism that lives in our system. So. Thank you, Amanda. And I, I mean, it is a big deal. The people who do make change work their lives are all of those fears that we, um, you know, that we kind of talked about for the past 30, 40 minutes. That is, that becomes a lifestyle, like living into those fears day in, day out, and just have like, Part, part of it comes with accepting them, but part of them also, part of that also comes with accepting that there is actual fallout and that you have to kind of find ways to sustain moving forward, even when the fallout, even when the thing you're afraid of happens. And so what I'd like to wrap with is an idea that came right before I started talking was an equity committee. Now, I don't want you to think, obviously, that committees are like, I mean, committees are the last thing that solve anything. And the concept is it's a group of people who get together to focus on an intentional topic. And that in and of itself provides even a small amount of the board can then reflect on things that the committee is doing. The committee can reflect on things the board is doing. And you can start to get just the slightest inkling of that like kind of external people reviewing your things, people checking your work for you and looking for more ways that you can do the work checking. Is this, is this, uh, what, in what ways does this group potentially talk to the district? Because we have lots of important things to think about in terms of like power, authority, and you having um, the kind of voice and the kind of influence and the kind of power that you have, what does it look like for you to do work with 
the equity committee that exists in the district? Or what does it look like for you to do work with the administrators? What does it look like for you to do work with community? I know I'm mostly raising more questions than I'm answering. But I, before we go into the next training, which is a couple months from now, I wanted us to really dig deep into the, definitely we have done change, more change needs to happen. What are the things that sometimes slow us down? What are the things that might keep us from making some changes, but make other changes easier? Because as we're doing this work, it's just the check-in that you have to do. Once you get started, you have to course correct every once in a while to make sure that you're on target with your mission, with your policy, with your goal. And that is the end of this implicit bias training. And I know that it was meandering. I hope that it was very deeply impacting because the work that you have to do as a board is made up of work that you do as individuals. And as individuals, um, I really wanted you to get a chance to push hard on the question of like, okay, change. Is it all just motions and resolutions? And if it's not, where are our limitations? What are the costs? And what do we have to potentially push against that feels scary to push against? All right. I you are the am best. gonna leave you yeah. there just Thank dangling. You, How go yeah. find committees to be part of. It'll be it'll be great. Hope your neck feels better, Mara. <laughs> um yeah. so yeah, I, I am going to bed immediately. Okay, go to bed. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Mara. And thanks for thank your you, patience Mara. too. These yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm also just really proud, proud and impressed of the work y'all keep doing. I just want to say that out loud. Just being in the meeting again reminded me. Y'all are awesome people. I'm really excited that you work for the district. Okay. Bye, folks. Hey, Mara. Yes. Bye, Mara. Great. That was excellent. Um, back to committees. Woohoo! Are you bringing it up? Yeah, literally, you can bring that back up. That'd be great. Um, so, one note on the school safety and police relations committee is: it looks like that work will probably go into April. Uh, that's um, we've, what already, I was we've already booked <laughs> some meetings in April, assuming um, we're hoping to be finished mid-April. But um, as we just talked about with Mara, you know, it's a time-consuming process. So I'm feeling pretty um, yeah. strapped for time with that committee commitment. And I don't feel like I'm doing the policy committee justice right now. I don't know what that means in terms of like, if I should maybe move to a different committee or um, just wait it out. But I think that's definitely your say. choice. Um, wait it out. <laughs> and I motion that you stay in the policy committee. <laughs> I motion that you stay with me. <laughs> Second. Well, Emma, can I ask a question about the SRO committee? Um, and and this is open. To, I, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I shouldn't do this. Never mind. Actually, I'm gonna hold my tongue, and we can we can chat later. Um, it's late. I feel like this is gonna open up a big discussion, so I'll hold. So should we just kind of work from top to bottom? That's what I'm thinking. Um, I was also thinking, you know, Kristen, if you have any preferences, you might want to put them out now so we can kind of think about it as we go down the list. Because um, we don't have a lot of lineup change. Um, and so, um, and so, 
Andrew's proposal about a, um, I forget, building facilities energy committee, that's sort of um, still being considered, but, um, you know, it's not, not listed here. Um, and then I guess, and then the equity committee is also something that might come to the fore. I guess I'm just trying, it sounds like there are also some things on the horizon. Um, and then this is probably further down the road, but there might be a committee that is um, dedicated to the RBS visioning, <clears throat> excuse me, visioning process. Yeah, so I would, I guess the first thing is, does anyone, let's assume those two committees will be formed, um, unless, does anyone have objections to either the Buildings, Facilities, and Energy Committee or Equity Committee? I think they're both great ideas, but, um, you know, we can approve them later, but it might make sense to just, unless people have objections, assume they'll be approved and, and appoint folks to them now so we can do it all as one big package. Um, and again, I can't see raise hands with the share of screen. So, yeah, I, I'd I'd make a motion that we we appoint members. I don't even know if we need a motion, but I I think we should appoint members to those two committees and charge those members with. Oh my God, this sounds ridiculous. But coming up with like a purpose, a vision for those committees, so that you know yeah. those committees have a focus, can stay on track. My view with the equity work is that that's a lens we should be using with everything we do. So I think having an equity committee that meets, I don't know how frequently the committee would meet, but that meets yeah. at least quarterly would be helpful for ensuring that we are, uh, you know, looking through that lens when we're doing that work. I think, I think that's, that's a, it's, that'd be really helpful. And I'm sure whoever's working on sounds like Mia, you, you might be working on, on that charge. Um, you, you might have some other ideas in mind, but whereas like the facilities and energy committee, that's not something that I feel like we're going to be looking through that lens with absolutely everything we're doing. That's kind of like a more. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think the two new committees need to be formed and then the first order of business for I think the members is to bring a charge to the board to approve. Okay, excellent. Um, and I think the other one was that Kristen asked about was the Roxbury visioning ex exercise that we've talked about heading into next year. And I don't know if that would be a committee or or what that would look like. We talked about it at last year's retreat and then between the pandemic, SRO, and ev everything else that comes with being on a school board and, and dealing with those issues. We haven't gotten back there, but it is a it is something we should we should get to this year. Yeah, I mean I think that should be a topic for the retreat and we should give some thought to how that is gonna happen. But I think definitely feel that we need one of the Roxbury board members to be integrally involved in that process, whatever shape it takes. Um, so I, I think, you know, Jerry and Kristen, you might want to keep that in mind. Um, could, could we, um, is Anna still on the line? Could we get that proposal sent to Kristen? And actually I could use a copy too, or actually everybody, because a lot of people have haven't seen it. The original proposal from, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if we still have it, but we can look for it. Okay, okay, great, thanks. Do um, we? Have, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, and so I don't know what sort of customary, like this is my first um, board experience, but if I should, you know, pick one or pick two, um, you know, I feel like I have a fair amount of learning to do just about kind of basic, you know, board operations. But, you know, um, you know, I think I would be interested in, um, you know, lending some energy to the facilities and energy committee as well as the equity committee. I mean, those are, and they're also unformed and maybe it'd be wise for me to join something that has kind of, you know, a more um, solid identity and clear mission. Um, but those are the two that stand out to me that I'd be interested to lend my energy to. Andrew, you're going to be on the, are you going to be on the facilities and energy committee, Andrew? I'd, I'd like to, at least at the beginning. Um, 
Yeah, at least for this year. Because that would that would resolve the problem of you being new, Kristen, because Andrew knows everything. That is not true at all. <laughs> There's a lot that I do not know. Can I make a plug for the policy committee? Amanda and I are both new and there's a lot of work to be done. Um, so I, I don't know if it's possible, but I feel like it would be, you know, Bridget used to be on the committee and when she resigned, that meant that we do not have someone with a legal background um, on that committee. So I don't know if it's possible. I said the same thing before this meeting. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm I'm willing to be on the policy committee, but um, yeah, let's look at what else is on my plate and maybe take a couple things off, or at least a thing off. I think negotiations is going to be a lesser lift heading into next year, which is going to free up a lot of us who have been very consumed by that. Yeah. And as much as yeah. I would love to work with Amanda and do love working with her, if if you come into the policy committee, if it makes sense for me to shift out and take your spot somewhere else, I'm open to that. That, that reminds me, Jim, are there any committee requirements in terms of number of people? I, I have a fuzzy recollection of that, but I also could have just made it up. I don't think so. Okay, I mean, I think so I made it up. I think if we get too many on, then we start to become the board. Um, okay. I think that's that's our only issue. Like, I, don't, I don't think we get a five. Yeah, I think you need to have less than half. But I would like to be in the equity committee and in the policy committee. That sounds great. Um, and Jim, I think Kristen also said equity committee. But yeah, Chris, I think equity committee is is great for you know it'd be great to have a representative of Roxbury on that too because I think um you know we want to make sure both communities are included in the equity work. Right. So who's an experienced person who could join the equity committee? Yeah Amanda <laughs> yeah the three of us I would I would love to do it too. I was just answering Jerry's question directly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we have, you know, we have, six of our members are one year or less experience. So, yeah, um, true. Oh, that experience. To... I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought you it's... meant experience with equity. No. <laughs> Got confused. Well, I mean, it'll help too. Yeah. Yeah. I think I can, I just put a plug for me and the equity committee as well because of uh, some of the work that you have done in the district as well. Um, yes, thank you. I, I would love to join the equity committee. Did, did, oh, I was going to say, did Jim just fall off that? Um, uh, he's still here. Oh. I'm here. Okay. I'm just eating and you don't need to see me. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Do we need a third person on the facilities and energy committee? If we do, I'm, I'd, I'd be happy to be on that, but only if it's helpful. Joe, I think it would definitely be helpful if you're willing to do it. Okay. Right. Um, I, would I think you count as a senior member of the board now, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Scary thoughts. One year ago, this town meeting day, I got elected to this board, and then the world changed. Yeah, that was... Okay. Um, I, I would also uh, love to, to serve on the superintendent evaluation committee. Um, it's just a, a, something that I am really passionate about is is using evals as a force for good <laughs> um and um i just i think i could do that once the school safety and police relations committee wraps up so i don't know if it makes sense you know if if folks will have me 
if we make that move right now or if we just wait until that the school safety committee work is done. So let's ask Anakit, um, do you have a preference? Do you want to switch I, around anything or? No, I think, I think that that's why I'm, I'm um, kind of quiet here, but I think I, I like to be on the finance committee. Um, I'm okay to be on the superintendent evaluation committee, but if there are more takers and I, I'm, I'm happy to drop off and then negotiations committee, I, because the negotiations are going on, I'll, you know, probably stick around there. You're not going to be great. in negotiations, Anakin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Tenfold, the last one. <laughs> Plus it's ending up, so you're going to, so you get a break. Yeah, I, I think the hope is, you know, in, in several months, all, you know, me, Jill, Jerry, Anakin, Jim will, will come free from, from those exercises. And that committee is particularly large because we've been in three collective bargaining negotiations at the same time. And they're, they're all very uh, time and energy intensive. So. And I'm happy to stay on the finance committee, but I didn't realize I was on that committee. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm happy to start being on it. What, what, what about, um, I feel like having one extra person on policy might be helpful if anybody wants to step up. I'd I'd be I don't know that I could do it full time. I could I could probably do it from time to time on certain policies. But I, I think three people and Emma feeling strapped being one of those people is um the policy committee it it's a heavy lift. And next year and the following year, there's probably gonna be a lot of heavy lifting there. So I think it would be good if we could have somebody else on there. And like I said, I'd be willing to join, but I don't think I'd, I'd be able to take on absolutely everything. I feel like we could divide the work a little bit better in the policy committee. And if we had four people, we could break up into groups of two, do work, and then maybe meet okay. less frequently, something like that. Well, and, no, and and if, you're, if you're willing, I think you'd be great. Um, Amanda, you're, you were saying something. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say that I think there is, um, there's also a lot of overlap with the equity committee um, that it's like, so I, I think you're right, Emma, that there could be a little bit of restructuring around the way the policy committee is set up and how, you know, and how, like, how it interacts with the rest of the committees, actually. Yeah, I agree. The School Safety Police Relations Committee right now is interested in some of our policies, and so that work is going to overlap, too. We could, we could even potentially, like, I could, I'd be happy to join. We could, we could, I guess we can't have more than four people on a committee. So I guess I'd put it to, like, Jerry, Anakit, um, Others, Jill, Jill, although Jill, you already have three committee assignments, so it's a lot. It's up to you. Anyways, I'm I'd be willing to Four. to yeah, go on. I just I worry we're we're we have so many committees and the, I, I worry maybe we're asking too much of the policy committee. So I kind of think this is good that we'll start out this way, but we might find that we can divide and conquer and delegate somehow a little bit. Yeah. For, for, and that's kind of what I was thinking with the energy policy, the net zero policy, that would be kind of kicked to the facilities committee. The facilities committee would then send it back to the policy committee, which would then bring it to the board kind of thing. Yeah. Um, process, but I'm not, I'm not stuck on that by any means. I like uh, kind of kind of thought. I mean, the policy committee could be in some ways like the OMB, you know, the final stopping place for things that are made in other committees. Um, there's, there's, there's two pieces of the policy committee. One is the existing policies and one is the creation of new policies. And those two things can live in separate walks, you know, like the 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 current policies reviewing and like making sure you know like following the you know asking the questions around protocols and whatnot 
but also like then if you have a net zero policy, which is the best committee that can actually understand all the ins and outs. Um, so it's like those two pieces, and we can create that structure. Yeah. So a lot of like new policies are, you know, originated in other committees and then go to the policy committee is kind of like a final review to make sure they're consistent, et cetera. And then they can go out. So the policy committee is not actually having to write all of this. When, whenever we have had new policies in the past, it's been a good process, but it's, it's taken, depending on the policy, it's taken several board meetings of the policy committee. And in this case, it might be another subcommittee. So this might be helpful for not having it take up so much in the way of board time because you'd already have different board members who have reviewed it in those different capacities in the past. That too, it has to come to the new policies have to come to the board right. in a public setting yeah. at three different times. Right. Oh, okay. So you have those so three, three readings. Yeah. Okay. Parliamentarian. I don't know much yet. I got to study up. I've got a, a half dog eaten copy of Robert's rules I can give you. So are we going to officially put Andrew's name? I, I heard of, I heard him come forward for the policy committee. Yes. I, I, I say we do. Does he say he does? <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to do it. Not say no. When, when I get off negotiations, that will really free up more of my time. So, yeah. And I, I think I think if we divide and 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 approach it that way, it'll be it'll be helpful. Hey, Jim. Since mm -hmm. Mia said she wanted to be on the superintendent evaluation committee. Um, I don't think that needs more than three people. So somebody could swap out of that. I'm trying to think. So where else is there a need? I also don't, if, if all three of you are happy being on that committee, and I think Jim, you might be required to be on that committee as chair. Yeah, I don't I, know. I think Jim is pretty essential as chair. Yeah. Although Jim, I mean, we can take on, um, well, yeah, I mean, having Mia on and having me kind of, you know, we would, we would take, like, yeah, I don't, I have, to, I think I have to be on it, but I don't necessarily have to be the most involved member. So, right. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think we can add Mia to that if she feels she has capacity. Yeah. It's more than, it's more than four that we can't have. Right. So four, yeah. four is okay. Four is okay. That'll be good in case somebody's not available. Yeah. And it's only for a, a spe specific amount of time that there's a lot of work and then it's okay. So where do we have holes? I'm sorry. I said, where do we have holes? If you will in negotiations the next time we negotiate, but that won't be for a, oh, that won't be for two years. Yeah. yeah. Jim, it looks like everything else is full. One question around the retreat: um, who who decides how the retreat is run? Like how the retreat is organized and the things that are going to be talked about and um, who's, who leads that? Do you? Um, I do, but I will like put something together and bring it to the board beforehand to make sure that we're kind of all on the same page about how we want to use the time. Um, and that's why I want to reach out and just get a sense of priorities, but we will, we will do it. We will do it at a board meeting before the retreat and set the agenda. Okay. Um, the the Main Street Middle School Building Committee we we suspended that, but I think based on on the current situation, it, frankly that 
the committee did, you know, it, it, it did do quite a bit of work that can be leveraged by the facilities and energy committee. But I don't think in terms of making recommendations about how to proceed with that building, I don't think, I don't think we're, we're in a great place to do that just because we don't know how, like exactly how this pandemic is going to play out. Hopefully it's done sooner rather than later, but there's also going to be lessons that have been learned when we go back to class, you know, normal classes from this. And I feel like, I, I feel like we, we should end that effort officially and end it. That's, that's how I feel. I'm open. I, you know, I'm just <laughs> speaking my mind on this. If anybody else has a strong opinion in the other direction, I won't be offended. Yeah, because if the, if more work comes up, couldn't it be moved into the Facilities and Energy Committee? Yeah, or we could create another ad hoc committee of this nature yeah. and have somebody from that committee or two people from that committee serve. Or it could just go to that committee. But I just don't really, you know, this committee... Was, do it, was was doing quite a bit of work for like six, seven months. And we saw an end to it like three, four months later, like right when the pandemic hit. But that's really kind of turned this, you know, how we use indoor space, you know, is a bit of a big question mark. Libby, do you, I, Libby, do you have any thoughts on this? I realize you're not on the board, but you were part of that committee and... So we're, we're a bunch of, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's prioritization at this point. If you're talking about zero energy, that's a bond. If you're talking about changing main street middle school, that's a bond. Um, so you're going to have, the board's going to have to make some decisions about what they're asking taxpayers to pay. And so continue with main street middle school. I agree with Jerry. I think that could be folded into facilities pretty easily. Yeah, I tend to agree. Jill, you're the other board member on that committee. Do you have any thoughts? Okay. Yeah, I agree. It's hard to have the conversation or make anything concrete without the context of the other buildings, right? So it's not really decisions you can make in isolation. So that makes sense to me. I don't I don't think at this point most of the members expected it to continue moving forward. Um, but I'll send an email out letting them know. Do we need to make a motion to officially end that committee? I think we can wrap it into a big motion that we're approving these committees, forming these two committees, and um, suspending, you know, or ending this committee. Great. So will we be doing that in the next five minutes? Because my dogs are giving me the side eye here. I think we can do it in the next five minutes. <laughs> My belly has a hole. That's what has a hole. <laughs> um, that looks good to me. Does, do we have any discuss, further discussion or does someone want to make an um, amendment to reappoint these committees with the name listed, um, charge the equity committee and the new buildings and energy committee with coming up with a charge to bring back to the board as well. So we know what that committee is supposed to do and um, formally ending the Main Street building, yeah, Main Street Middle School building committee um, with the idea that pieces of that work could be picked up by the the new buildings committee. I so moved, moved that. Oh, oh, good. Even even better. So moved. I'll second it. Any further discussion? Um, Jill. Aye. Emma. Aye. Jerry. Aye. Amanda. Aye. Uh, Kristen? Aye. Uh, Mia? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Did I call on you? Aye. Jerry? Did I call on you? Aye. I've got a weird screen listing here. Um, Annika? 
Aye. I think I got everyone. Um, so we do have to approve policy monitoring reports. Um, Emma, did you vote? Oh, good. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so policy monitoring reports, uh, we have the alcohol and drug free workplace and drug and alcohol testing, uh, transportation of employees. <coughs> um, any discussion around those reports or questions? Otherwise, we can just entertain a motion to approve them. Mia? I move we accept the policy monitoring reports for policies D8 and D11. I do have a second. I second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Um, Aye. No, yeah, I'm not supposed to do a roll, sorry. <laughs> uh, Jerry? Aye. Kristen? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Annika? Aye. Amanda? Aye. Jill? Aye. Emma? Aye. Mia? Aye. I think that's it. Um, so we talked about moving the superintendent uh, ES to just doing a special session sometime in the next week or so. Um, and I can send out a doodle poll. Do we feel we can do a quick negotiation update as part of that, or do we want to go into executive session and do a negotiation update now? Do we need to have that in the next week or so? Um, I don't, I don't think on, at least with Jill, Jerry, I, I think with our team that it won't make a difference based on our schedule. If we provide an update tonight or right. a week or two from now, um, the etiquette Libby thoughts, do you agree with that or? Yeah, I think, I think, um, I agree. It's the same thing with us as well. All right. Excellent. Um, so, uh, Great. So, uh, Anna will set out some proposed dates for the next week just to have a, an hour meeting to, to um, deal with those two topics. And um, also, a uh, doodle poll on some retreat rate dates in May. And just quickly, um, I think it would be good for us to have a full day in time. Do people want to try to spend a full day on Zoom, or do you want to do two half days so we don't? Um, bug out on our computer screens. Two half days for me. That's kind of my preference too. Yeah, anyone, anyone not want two half days? Okay, is, great. Is this so, going to be during the week? Yes. Okay, because I'll need to take time off work. Okay. Um, are there times that are easier for you than others? Fridays. Fridays are good. And like times of the Thursday. day, like afternoon, morning. Yeah, Thursday afternoon, Friday. Um, yeah. Yeah, that would work. Okay, we can try to aim for that. Does anyone else have a, have issues with Thursday and Friday? Those are actually good days for me, too. Okay, excellent. Thursday morning might not work with me, but Thursday afternoon is good. Yeah, Thursday yeah. afternoon is good. All right. Um, so if you could just find some Thursdays and Fridays that are open on Libby's calendar in, in May and and send a doodle, that would be great. And then just um, for the executive session, do you want to do 5 to 6 or 6 to 7, 5.30 to 6.30? Any preferences? 5.30 works better for me. 5.30 to 6.30 blocks? Well, maybe, and I just maybe give a few, like, you know, 5 to 6, 6.30 to... Yeah, you know, five thirty to six thirty, and, and six to seven, and to see which 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 works best. You know, over the next kind of week and a half. Um, all right, thanks everyone. Uh, great meeting. Uh, motion to adjourn, and congrats again to to all the newly elected folks, and uh, congrats and, and welcome to Kristen. Jill, do you have a question? Your hand. Yeah, is I just. I oh, sorry. Just really quick, I, I meant to say this during the consent agenda, so I apologize. As the parliamentarian, I'm not following the rules, but I just wanted to thank Libby for that update about your testimony. 
um, that, that I know that those reports probably take a fair amount of time to write and they're kind of the highlight of the packet to me. So thank you for explaining that and for spending all the time in those committees on behalf and then also explaining the why behind why that particular recommendation was not good and the things that we are doing, that was really helpful. And uh, it also just reminded me of listening to NBPR and also just feeling really grateful for the outreach and the, the time that you put in to do that kind of public communication stuff, not just for Montpelier, but for and Roxbury, but for the whole state. So that's all. Thank you for doing that. Yes, no, um, you're here. Um, motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. Is that it? No second. I second. Uh, Jerry. Aye. Kristen. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Etiquette? Aye. Amanda? Yay. Jill? Aye. Emma? I'll say aye, and I also want Kristen to know that we don't usually go this far over the schedule. Not usually. Not usually, um, but sometimes. <laughs> Lately, we have two times. Yeah. Uh, Mia? Aye. I think that's it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Jerry, get those dogs out of the house. <laughs> wow. Jerry's dog has an opinion about how long this meeting has lasted. Good, Good night, everyone. everyone. Thank you. Bye, Kristen.